Yeah, my name is Katie Fitzgerald and I'm the director of the Aspen Challenge Program. I have the lucky fortune to work on the Aspen Challenge Program with my colleague Zachary Epps, who is right over here to my right. <laughs> You will be hearing more from Zach in a little bit. And Kara Minardi, who is expecting her first child any day now. Kara, if you're watching, we miss you. Um, and Kara is on the East Coast, and so we miss Kara dearly, but the three of us have the lucky fortune of running the Aspen Challenge Program. So welcome to what is the culmination of months and months and months of hard work and dedication by our young people here that you're about to hear from. The Aspen Challenge Program was an idea that came to us by Jackie and Mike Bezos. They wanted to take the core principles of the Bezos Scholars Program, who are remarkable young people sitting right here. And if you don't know about the Bezos Scholars Program, I encourage you to learn more about what these young people are about to embark on for the next year of your lives, because it's pretty incredible. Um, but we decided to take the core principles of the Bezos Scholars Program and bring it to more young people in different parts of the country. Um, so we decided to go in some of our nation's largest urban areas. Um, we just completed our sixth year of the Aspen Challenge. We launched in Los Angeles and moved to Denver, Colorado, Washington, Washington, D.C., Chicago, Illinois, my hometown where I grew up, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and, mo <laughs> and most recently, Dallas, Texas. Woo! The Aspen Challenge Program is an eight-week, very intense, right, very intense work period. Um, where we challenge young people to create solutions to society's toughest issues. These are issues that young people face on a daily basis in their lives. So we challenge them to think critically, think hard about how they would come up with creative solutions to these problems. We give them eight weeks to change the world. Um, and what you will see today is they actually accomplish amazing, remarkable, incredible things in eight weeks. So like I said, it's an honor to be part of this program because I'm inspired every day by these young people. I have my daughters and my mom and some friends in the back because I want to further the inspiration to as many young people around the world as we possibly can. Um, so once we gather teams of high school students, we have an opening forum where we bring together speakers and thinkers from all around the country and the world to challenge our young people. They challenge them to come up with creative solutions to topics that they work on in their daily lives. Once again, we give them eight weeks, and then we reconvene to have a competition where we gather community leaders from the cities that we are in to judge the work of our young people. They're judged on things like creativity, feasibility, sustainability, real world things that make, these, make sure that these projects live on beyond the eight weeks. They actually start remarkable things in eight weeks, and they live on well beyond that. I'd like to cue a video to show you a little snapshot of what this program looked like in Dallas, Texas last year. We're very excited to finally be in Dallas. And this group of kids in particular, they seem up for the challenge. We have presenters that are presenting really serious challenges that not only face the Dallas region, but face our country. And then we're giving young people the guidance and the resources so that they can help us solve those problems. Students have come together to listen to different challenges, be it taking care of hunger, poverty, depression, loneliness and try to find solutions for our communities that will bring us all together and bring more unity. As a child, they're always wondering. They're always fascinated with life. And we need to sometime as adults step back, step to the side and let them take over. With this particular group of students where they've been picked essentially for their leadership qualities, like that is going to be a huge factor in this, right? So the ones who, who, can, who can see something and make it happen and have the, pers the persistence and the will to do that, I think is going to be really important. You challenge them and you stand there with them shoulder to shoulder and when they stumble, you help them get right back up and keep going and sometimes that means you have to walk with them. Everyone wants a chance to make their environment better. Let's give them that chance. Their minds haven't been clouded by everything else, right? That unfortunately, as adults, we maybe become a little bit jaded. We just kind of start forgetting that we also live among other human beings. 
It helps bring a lot of communities together at once. From one culture to another, we can combine our knowledge and our ideas and make up like an amazing solution. You're still trying to figure out who you are and what you want to be, and I think you should always figure out ways in life to improve yourself. That should never stop. That shouldn't have a cap, you know? It, it should be limitless. Expect to be blown away in eight weeks when they come back with their solutions. I think a lot of times we assume that students don't have solutions, they're too young, they don't have enough experience, they don't know enough, and that was not the case. They were brilliant, they were innovative. They didn't experience the barriers of bureaucracy or uh, the old way of doing things, so it just allowed them to break through. I was taken away by how impacted they were by each of the issues that they selected and how um, thoughtful they were in their response. I was really moved and I was not ready for it at all. It was really great. This challenge was a great opportunity for me to meet new people, to be engaged in the community, and to be able to play my part in society by bringing and helping people and trying to learn new things and share my ideas as well. We got a chance to reach out to the community and interact and get them involved. It doesn't matter if you win, it's just, it matters about the change. Basically, they helped me. They started talking to me because like I'm a freshman, they're higher classmen. They started impacting me to impact others ongoing years once I get older. It's not necessarily that you have to reinvent the wheel, it's being innovative with the wheel that you have. And I think that that's what the Aspen Challenge allows you to do. And I think five years from now, what they've started can only get bigger, especially if they have more time. They were fired up about what they were talking about. They were passionate about what they were, what they were doing and what they were engaged with. And that I think that if you have passion, um, there's, there's nothing you can't accomplish. When I look out in that audience, I see truth. The truth of their lives, the truth that they may not be being heard or may not have the resources to make the change that they want to see happen. And so I'm rejuvenated in knowing that they've been listened to, they've been supported, and they've been given the opportunity to learn. This is a structure and a platform that one, gives stage, creates space, and then gives a mic to the kids and say, hey, you're capable, your voice is important, your ideas are important, let's go do it. That's what the Aspen Challenge is to me. I just want to follow them now, yeah. Can they be our president? Can they be our bosses? I mean, I say that kind of jokingly, but in all seriousness too, I'm excited. I get excited. If they are leading our tomorrow, then our tomorrow is very bright. Aspen Challenge empowers them, can accelerate the process, gives them some tools to use, and by God, it swings the gates open and says, get at it. I think that's why this organization and this, this effort is just so powerful because we need it now more than we probably have in an entire, an entire generation. So we could not do all we do without champions on the ground in each of these communities. The, not only the school district and the students and the teachers embrace us, but so do the communities. There's a few people in the audience I need to recommend. Re, rec yep, yep, Stephanie Nadoff. Don't shake your head. Come on, Stephanie Nadoff. Donna Frisbee Greenwald from Philadelphia. <laughs> Leslie Stevens and Christian Pierce. Are you in the room from Dallas, Texas? They were literally our champions on the ground. They're here somewhere. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And none of this would be possible without the vision and dedication of Jackie and Mike Bezos. Thank you so much. I mean, they hate that, but I had to say it. And Nicole Hansen um, and the rest of the team at the Bezos Family Foundation literally walks with us side by side as we activate and ignite the spark that lives within all of our young people. So thank you to everybody at the Bezos Family Foundation. It's incredible. Um, Although she's not a core member of the Aspen Challenge team, there's a girl named Rachel Sverdlove, who probably everybody knows, but she is on the ground with us in every single city and here with us in Aspen. She's part of our broader youth and engagement. Rachel, thank you for everything that you do for us. 
We, um, and I mean by most of the people in this room that are engaged in this work, believe young people deserve a seat at the table when we're discussing issues they face on a daily basis. They should be at the table with us, and I think after today, you will too. Um, Zach Epps, I'd like to invite you to stage to take it from here. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks, Katie. Ooh. Thank you, Katie. Uh, and, you know, you've heard, welcome again, thank you for being here, uh, and thank you for being here for them, because that's what it's all about, elevating youth voice and ensuring that they really have agency. Uh, and so you, you've heard that they spent eight weeks working on their projects, but we started this process in October of last year. So over the last eight months, we've been on this journey with them, speaking weekly, texting our coaches at a certain point. And so today is really a culmination of the last eight months, but let's push them, let's continue to inspire them and push them to continue their work in many different ways. So our first school that's coming up, as you saw in the video at our opening forum and, and uh, competition event, we decorate the room with their pictures. So from the very moment they walk in, they know who matters most to us. And this first team that you're gonna hear from, I had a very special feeling about them from the moment I got their headshots. I was like, wow. These are really good, I need to change mine. And not only are, were they impressive right from that start, they're one of the most diverse schools in all of Dallas. And so I'm gonna welcome to the stage, Impact from Emmett J. Conrad High School. Nous sommes les thèses d'un infirmage dans Jena Park. Nous sommes Berlin parce que nous ne connaissons pas le thème. Moi, je vous ai dit que ma soeur m'a dit que nous sommes les thèmes. 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 Hi, my name is Masa Samaharo and I am French Ivory Coastian and my parents are from Liberia. My name is Ashley Hidalgo, and I am a second-generation immigrant from Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. Hi, my name is Ruha, and I was born in Iran, and I am a member of uh, the Baha'i Faith. Hi, my name is Sharif. I am Somali, and I was born in Russia. Hi, my name is Nora. I was born in Iran, and my family moved to the United States when I was 10. Hi, my name is Romain, and I was born in South Dallas. Hi, my name is Sandra, and I'm a second generation of immigrant from Guerrero, Mexico. Hi, my name is Mohan, and I'm from the Gambia. And we are Impact! Impact. So, guys, we decided to, ex <laughs> we decided to accept Gavi Pacheco's challenge, which was to design a program that fosters empathy and creates supports from immigrants, regardless of their documentation status. We are located in Dallas, Texas, and our city has a population of about 1.3 million people and has very diverse communities, some which are very wealthy and others like our Victory Meadow, which is very diverse but has low income. Dallas has about 25% black people and 42% of Hispanic descent. The community in which our school resides is one of the most diverse in the country. We have over 30 different nations represented in the 5.2 square mile area. So in our neighborhood, 42.3% of residents are foreign born, compared to the total of 24.7% in Dallas. And most households make less than 30,000 annually. In our school, more than 50 different languages and dialects are spoken. And over 60% of students are English language learners. So it only made sense for us to play our part in fostering support and empathy for our diverse group of students, uh, neighbors, and community members. We soon realized that the task at hand was monumental and that we needed a broad range of skill sets and talents to be able to create a more effective solution. And so we created IMPACT, which stands for Initiating Meaningful Progress Amongst Cultures Today. And it is a club in our school that is made up of both Aspen and non-Aspen student members who are just as passionate about this cause as we are and they have helped us in all parts of our solution. The root of the Vickery Meadow community is the students. So we created a mentor program in collaboration with an already existing club called Journeys that consists of 40 recently resettled immigrants. Our mentor program focuses on providing a safe space for these recent immigrants to share ideas and learn more about America. 
During our first meetings, we asked the Journeys mentees to take a survey that would let us know what kind of support they lack as they try to navigate the education system. 100% of them said they plan to attend college, but 96% of them said they don't know how or where to apply. Therefore, we focused our meetings around homework help and college information. The Impact Journeys Mentor Program is ongoing and has been successful so far. In bringing our focus back to the neighborhood as a whole, we decided to challenge our abilities and throw a community fair. The goal of the fair is to give all immigrants essential information to use in their daily lives. Now we knew for sure that we did not want the fair to be an event where community members are just handed papers. We wanted it to be useful and interactive and practical at the same time. So we reached out to organizations that we felt had something to offer to our community. We reached out to more than 30 organizations and seven amazing organizations contributed to our fair. We hosted the fair on March 10th in our school cafeteria. The fair consisted of Know Your Rights workshops by RICES that taught immigrants how to react when confronted by the police or ICE. We also had a STEM volunteer expose young immigrants to possible career choices. In addition to those booths, we also hosted tables with information on English classes, photo booths, arts and crafts tutorials, and a busting stereotypes exhibit. According to the survey that we took at the fair, 48.6% of people ranked our fair as extremely useful. Additionally, 91.2% of people at the fair said that they learned something new. So we created a website that highlights facts and stereotypes about the different types of countries in Bakery Meadows. Visitors to this website will see these recent immigrants as individuals rather than a stereotype. So we inter interviewed a girl named Yamlak from Ethiopia, and this is her story. Hello, my name is Yamlak Lema. I am a senior here at Carmen High School, and I am 17 years old. I was originally born in Ethiopia. I came towards the end of 2008. My dad, when I was born, my dad got a job out here. Like, um, It's like a raffle ticket to see like who gets to leave the country. And so he left when I was like a good two months old. And um, he was living out here. And so he, once he got his citizenship, he started the process to bring me and my mom and my, my little brother. all history and it's nothing like that either and they also think that it's a uh, Ethiopia is a dry country it's really not it's like it's raining all the time and it's, it's not it's nothing like everybody I would like to say that like um, a lot of the stereotypes that is said isn't so much true it's the, I would say the difference is language and, and culture maybe, but like nothing else, like uh, we don't do anything out of the ordinary, we all go to school, we're all humans, we all, you know, go to sleep and, yeah. We invited students from our Journeys and Impact Club to volunteer with an organization known as the Environmental League. We participated in community beautification projects and events in which we helped clean the littered trails, ponds, and park around our school. This helped program members gain experience in community service in the new neighborhoods, in their new neighborhood, and new society, which they know as America. We have planned many, excuse me, we have planned many different uh, activities for our Impact Club and journeys. In addition to, in addition to, uh, God. <sighs> <laughs> Okay, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. In addition to our meetings, we have planned events that would teach immigrants about the American culture. We have planned events such as uh, a Halloween costume contest, gift exchange, and community service. By doing so, we hope to bond with our classmates. And this is a great way for us to interact with our classmates. Also, we have, in order to make our solution uh, sustainable and transferable, we have created Impact in a Box. It includes a six-week planning program on how to mentor your own, <laughs> your own planning program and how to uh, plan your own community fair. By doing so, we hope to impact the immigrants around the Dallas community area and maybe even the United States. All right, y'all ready to get live in here? 
All right, all right, let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> Y'all ready? Let's get it. The group impact is just like a pack. We stay together while we're taking down the stereotypes to replace them with facts. Speaking of facts, every foreign country not below us. Every Middle Eastern not here trying to bomb our soldiers. Every Asian not coming here just to take our jobs. And everybody not terrorists because they were in jobs. That's why we call impact initiating meaningful progress in my coaches today. I know y'all like that. So when y'all leave, I hope our name got a ring to it. And if you do the same, just follow how we all do it. Like the Nike check, no thing. Just go and do it. Hey, be that contribution to create this huge movement. So when you think of impact, think of a huge boom. Because after destruction, there comes a new bloom. A breath, a fresh air, because we're being so serious. Like waking up every day to eat your morning breakfast. Starting today, let's make a bet. I bet that all of y'all won't take the time to actually look at one fact. That's the truth of any stereotype that's been given To all the foreign countries and people that's living In the U.S. of A, let's make America great By changing one day at a time to make minorities straight I really hope y'all will join this thing Because I'm Roman's favorite letter representing my team Thank you Hey, y'all thought I was done? Hey, I'm just getting started, I'm just getting started If y'all can say it with me, say it All right R O M A N E 7 L E T T E R, that's me. R O M A N E 7 L E T T E R, that's me. R O M A N E 7 L E T T E R, that's me. R O M A N E 7 L-E-T-T-E, oh, that's me. Romain is gonna be on top of everything, like the star of a Christmas tree. When it comes to the industry, I'm making a big pack, you know But I'm just here to win it and make the millions. My main goal is to get my bloodline lifting out the trenches. I apologize for bringing all of my pain to Vincent, but I gotta get my name out while I'm still here in Aspen. As a matter of fact, shout out to the Aspen Challenge. If it wasn't for them, y'all would've never seen my talent. Y'all would've never seen my talent. Y'all would've never seen my talent. I'm grateful every day that I'm still standing. I plan to go down in the books as a living legend. Shout out to the team that I was blessed with. Ruha, Sharif, Noor, Masa, Ashley, Martin, Sandra, keep all the love, wave it like an ocean. Shout out to my queens that I call my coaches. 2018, everybody in here taking over. And we're just gonna take impact and make it global. So starting today, let's try to make a bigger circle by linking up, chatting it up to keep the ball in motion. So let's start off with me to keep the wave flowing. Ever since productions, that's my future fortune. As a record label, I'm gonna get it sorted. So show me y'all the love so I can keep it going. Everybody in here, I love the vibe y'all showing. So thanks to y'all, I'm gonna keep my music life going. And I won't stop until I'm living by palm trees and oceans. Now that I finished, everybody say this. R-O-M-A-N-E-7. L-E-T-T-E-R, that's me. R-O-M-A-N-E-7. L-E-T-T-E-R, that's me. R-O-M-A-N-E-7. L-E-T-T-E-R, that's me. R-O-M-A-N-E-7. L-E-T-T-E-R, that's me. Let's keep it going. Let's keep the round of applause going. Impact. That's, that's Impact featuring Romaine Seventh Letter. That's awesome. That's awesome. So we're going to keep it going. Our next team also hailing from Dallas, Texas, Moises E. Molina, Mobility for All. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know oh, 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 a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. We are the change. We're mobility for all. We are M4A. M4A. Straight out of Dallas, Texas, I am Andres Diaz. I am Tatiana Clifton. I'm Francisco Morales. I'm Claudia Arduna. I'm Evelyn Ogin. And I'm Lady Lee Sanchez, and we are from Molina High School. <clears throat> so, the vision for m is simply to empower those of the vulnerable subpopulation. <clears throat> we partner with both public and private sector companies to ease chronic transportation stress and improve community cohesion. The challenge which was given to us by 100 Brazilian cities, Smita Rauch and Eric Wilson, was to come up for a solution for, well, mobility. <laughs> so, at m we decided to make our focus on the DAS residents who are dependent on public transportation. 
primarily those within the silent sector, which is where we live. And sadly, less than 1% of those jobs are accessible by public transit. So to further explain this, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it to my friend, Frankie. Thank you, Andres. This is an image of most cities on a day-to-day -day basis. Is this what you want your future to look like? <clears throat> well, it's supposed to say, um, I forgot, um, sorry. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> We analyzed the work of Dr. Shima Kamari and Dr. Di um, David Weinreich on the studies of transportation equity and the access opportunity of transit dependent population in Dallas. Oh, yeah. And this is a map of Dallas. And parts in red shows where the jobs are, but it also shows where it takes the longest to get to. And this map in parts in red shows the transit dependent core area, and while in blue also shows where the jobs are. It roughly takes an hour and 45 minutes to get to using DART. But what is DART? That's a great question, Frankie. What is DART? DART is Dallas Area Rapid Transit. It's our public transportation system which includes bus and light rail. Some little known services DART provides is their employer program, which educates their employees on DART services. They also, they also provide taxi vouchers, paratransit services, and micro transit for the elderly and disabled. Here are some pictures with our meetings with Teresa O'Donnell, Chief of Resilience of Dallas, Todd Plesko, and Mike Miles, Vice Presidents of DART. At our meetings with City Hall and DART officials, we found there was inadequate service in the southern sector and no service at all in Pleasant Grove. However, we also found there was inadequate city infrastructure to support DART. The southern sector needs better city infrastructure, and that's the city of Dallas's responsibility. Here shows a map of the only railroad system in the southern sector, which has already proven to be a success and has flourished the area surrounding it. The area outlined in red shows Pleasant Grove, which has no DART service. That's right. Therefore, City Hall and DART must mutually agree to develop resources in the southern sector, and this will improve their quality of life. M4A will advocate for the residents of the low socioeconomic status, including the elderly and the disabled. As a nonprofit, 501c3, M4A will advocate for transit center hubs that will eliminate food deserts, create jobs, and allow better access to health care. We believe that the most effective way to communicate the voice of those in need is for an M4A member to be placed on the DART board. So we are now studying the process. Now, let's talk about, about bike share, another mode of transit. Thank you, Evelyn. The city of Dallas has no rules on where bikes are regulated. The bike share programs are funded by venture capital, and in about two years when that money's all gone, they'll be forced to leave Dallas. The bike share program is not connected to any other mode of transit, despite their claims otherwise. This here is a picture of the DART rail in downtown Dallas during St. Patrick's Day, a day that is widely celebrated throughout the city of Dallas. As you can see, there are no bikes present. This is a bike graveyard. You can find this in any other major city that has the bike share program. Would you want your city to look like this? <laughs> I wouldn't. Tatiana is right, and in order to prevent this from happening, the city of Dallas must partner with bike share companies, and they must write their requirements to also become a bike share company. The city can partner with bike share companies to request service to transit-dependent populations. They can also empower their residents with financial incentives to own their own bike. M4A is committed to giving away bikes at no cost to people of low socioeconomic status. Yes, we have partnered with our school to raise money to buy bikes and give them away to people like Jose. Jose had to travel one hour a day in travel time to get to and from the bus station. And since the competition, we have continued to give away bikes, significantly saving up to people, saving up to one hour a day for people to travel. <clears throat> Our primary, focus for our, community, um, <clears throat> our primary focus for our community volunteer work will be assisting the elderly and the disabled. When reaching out to our community residents, we discovered that the elderly and the disabled were underserved in the area of transit. The challenge is not the first and last mile of public transport. Many elderly and disabled re <clears throat> residents need assistance from their front door all the way to their destination. M4A is partnering with Methodist Medical Center to develop a program made up of M4A volunteers. Our services will include assistance from the entrance to the doctor's office, assistance in and out on wheelchairs, and counseling on transportation services to help patients' needs. 
Our volunteers will receive special training to ensure that our patients are aided correctly. Since competition, we have been working with Jennifer Tillery, who heads the volunteer effort at Methodist Medical. We are also implementing classes to instruct the elderly and the disabled on DART services. M4A is an advocacy organization designed to speak for the people of low socioeconomic status, the elderly, and the disabled. M4A has applied to be a 501c3 nonprofit organization that will be continuously funded through grants and fundraising events. By maintaining and expanding our relationships with city officials and our executives, we will become not only advocates but trusted advis advisors for the vulnerable population. In order to keep our volunteer staff, we have submitted a request to the Molina administration to implement an urban studies class focused on transportation. This will not only motivate the volunteers to pursue careers in public service, but it will motivate them to keep giving back to the community long after high school. Since the competition, we have been working on building a relationship with Dr. Shima Hamidi from the University of Texas at Arlington. We have we have submitted our request to the Molina administration for an urban studies class, and we hope to place M4A graduates on Dr. Shima Hamidi's urban studies program at UTA. Building a more vibrant, cohesive community. We found it very fulfilling to reach out and interact with people in our community. In the process of um, studying transit and mobility, we met, a new we met new people and gained a better understanding of their problems, their urban issues. We believe that new modes of transit will bring people of different backgrounds together and it will um, come and form a more vibrant, cohesive community. And mobility, mobility for, for all. all. Good job, Frankie. Thanks. Can we give them another round of applause? Because at this point, I've heard their presentations at least three times, and I'm still in disbelief. I'm like, that's really systemic change that they are uh, really creating in their city. And not just they, they didn't mention how city council in Dallas has now taken on this issue in a different way. And so they're really informing not just their school, uh, but at some point Dallas, Dallas at large. Uh, so again, we have two more teams that you're going to be amazed by. Uh, our next uh, team from Sunset has a really another special place for me because uh, we've spent a lot of time together, more than other teams, we've spent a lot of time together throughout this process. And so their growth has been, I consider it a privilege, not just to witness their growth, but to be a part of that. And so without further ado, we have Dreamers Not Criminals from Sunset High School. Nearly 180,000 illegal immigrants with criminal records ordered deported from our country are tonight roaming free to threaten peaceful citizens. The number of new illegal immigrant families who have crossed the border so far this year already exceeds the entire total from 2015. Hi, my name is Araceli Ramirez. Hi, my name is Karen Lopez. Hi, my name is Michael Centeno. Hi, my name is Andrea Torres. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Diaz. Hi, my name is Luis Hernandez. Hi, my name is Ariana Ortiz. Hi, my name is Jasmine Rios. And, and together we are Dreamers, dreamers Not, not criminals. criminals. We had the opportunity to take on Gabby Pacheco's challenge, which was to create a program that supports and fosters empathy on immigrants, whether they're undocumented or undocumented. We picked this challenge because Sunset is 99% of Hispanic, but also our community of Oak Cliff. We love this challenge because it's gonna give these people a voice. They're gonna give them, we're gonna give them a chance to let their story be heard because that's what they deserve. They belong here just like everybody else in here. And we're so excited to take on this. And we have a dreamer in our team, Karen. 
Hello, my name is Karen Lopez. We have 64,000 people who are eligible for DACA and we have 94% who are currently employed. This relates to my story because I am a dreamer. And I have to say that it was not an easy path for me because I came to the United States when I was only five years old. I remember going to school and coming home to my mom crying because I didn't understand what the teachers were telling me. So my parents decided to enroll me and my older brother to an after-school program where we had the chance to learn how to speak English in less than a year. And to me that meant a lot because it's not an easy language to learn and me and my brother managed to learn it in less than a year. Currently, the last year of February 27, 2017, my parents decided to, to start my process for DACA, and I am proud to say that I got all my documents together this year, February 27 of the year 2018. Thanks to that, now I'm able to graduate from my school, Sunset High School, this year, 2019, and I will am gladly to say that I'm starting my application to attend the university this year, July. And this project is really important to me because I get the opportunity to stand up for my family, for my community, and let them know that they're not alone. They have the right to stand up for their rights and they have the right to be heard and so they can speak out and tell everybody their story because it's not easy to stand up in front of a stage and open up to people who I don't know. And also, uh, we have other stories. Uh, you can check it out in our Instagram page. We have this student who graduated from college and uh, it would be awesome if y'all would check out the stories in our Instagram page. After spending some time thinking about how we could help everyone in the community, we as a team decided to start our resource center at our campus in Sunset High School. We decided to start the resource center in the annex building across the street because it comes with a lot of benefits. This is where we will be painting our mural, which will be dedicated to dreamers and will hopefully spread a positive message to anyone who is not a dreamer. It is very visible to all of the students and the public, and it is where everyone in our area goes to vote. Our research center will offer GED and ESL classes, help and information with DACA, and help answering any questions you might have. We hope to add even more resources in the future as we grow and find out how we can further help. We also want the research center to be an option to everyone, so we have decided to partner up with Rosemont Elementary School and Peabody Elementary School to spread the word about Dreamers Not Criminals and to let everyone know that we are here to help and support them. The League of United Latin American Citizens is the oldest surviving Latino civil rights organization in the United States. LULAC has partnered with our organization, Dreamers Not Criminals. Our community is 69% Hispanic, but the greater proportion of voters are white. We want to see more of our people from our community voting at our school location. Thank you. Sunset had over 400 people register to vote. This is as nearly as many people that voted in our school annex building at the last presidential election. By voting, you are making your voice heard and registering your opinion on how you, how you think the government should operate. There was a Latino street fest held in downtown Dallas April 29th where all Hispanic organizations gathered up to not only spread their inherited culture through music, dance, and culinary arts. And so we decided to collaborate with Avance, a, non a nonprofit organization, to not only promote our proposition of policy or our concept of having voting 
required in the senior checklist, but to help any dreamer at the spot. And so I got the honor to interview this successful DACA recipient because he told me his story about he was how he was not able to go to the college of his choice because of his legal status until his DACA status came back. And now he's able to attend the UTA, the school he wanted to go to. And then on the event, our love was started to break down and started having some structural issues. And so that's when I got inspired by the monarch butterfly, which its natural migration patterns crosses the US-Mexico border throughout its successful 3,000 mile journey. And so I used the monarch butterfly base for the Dream of Not Criminals logo. And then I added the flags of the countries with the highest number of immigration to the United States. And we are gonna use this logo for the voting poll mural and we are gonna create a new travel love war this fall. Thank you. When thinking about DACA, the first thing we thought about was reframing the wall into something positive. We created a love law to foster empathy towards undocumented people. Not only does our love law demonstrate empathy, but as well as undocumented people's stories and how difficult it was for them to come over here for a better life. We want to touch people who voted for our current president. We want them to see that undocumented people are not criminals, but dreamers that are hardworking people with amazing goals in life. As a child with undocumented relatives, I see the struggle every day. The fear is always present that you'll be discovered. Every outing raises a possibility of exposure. Even everyday tasks like going to work, grocery shopping, or even taking your kids to school. <laughs> okay. As our project grew and the fear of deportation widespread under new immigration policies, we found the need to show the people that they can show their face by, by our booth. Uh, that to sh we wanted to make it possible for people to show their face, to be proud of who they are and when they're from, to diminish the fear that's oppressing them. For our first event, we, we set up a photo booth and offered free photo strips to immigrants and DACA recipients that were willing to talk to us and share their story with us. We had pretty good success and planned to set up a sh uh, show your face booth at each of our exhibits openings at the library and cultural centers. The photos and stories taken will then be incorporated into our touring art installation. Now, oh. one of our missions was, how are we gonna be able to get these people to talk about their story and let them be heard? So we went to our local grocery store, El Rio and Oak Cliff, and we got to interview some of the workers there. Hola, buenas tardes. ¿Cómo se llama? Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Rosalía Guerra. Bueno, pues. ¿Cuáles han sido algunas dificultades desde el momento que ha llegado aquí? Las dificultades que he tenido yo aquí. Sí. Pues mira, ahorita era, señores, no he visto algo difícil, la verdad, he tenido trabajo eh, por los 10 años que yo tengo aquí en este país, que la verdad es un país enorme, grandísimo, de muchas oportunidades, y hasta ahorita no he visto algo difícil que me trunque seguir aquí en este país. Bueno, ¿por qué hizo la decisión de venir a los Estados Unidos? Porque, como en cada país, ¿verdad? muchos inmigrantes son, en mi país no hay tantas oportunidades como lo hay en este país. Nosotros nos vinimos aquí para un mejor futuro para nuestra familia. ¿Y cómo llegó usted a los Estados Unidos? Pues ahora sí llegué como la mayoría de las personas, ¿verdad? tenemos que cruzar el río, todo eso. Son... El río. Exactamente. Bueno, pues muchas gracias. Ok. <risa> Hola, buenas tardes, ¿cómo se llama? Uh, mi nombre es Luis Marqués. Bueno, pues vamos a empezar. ¿Cuáles han sido algunas dificultades desde el momento que ha llegado a mi casa? 
Um, hasta el momento no he tenido problemas, solo algunas veces con el trabajo. ¿Por qué hizo la decisión de llegar a los Estados Unidos? Uh, por un mejor futuro. ¿Un mejor futuro? Sí. ¿Qué tanto tiempo tiene viviendo usted aquí? Diez años. Diez años. ¿Y cómo usted llegó aquí a los Estados Unidos? Caminando, cruzando la frontera. Caminando y cruzando la frontera. Sí. Bueno, muchas gracias. Sí, gracias. As you can see in the the graphs, we had three three hundred and seventeen thousand seven hundred and fifty six immigrants living in Dallas, Texas. We want to say, as a couple of high schoolers in in high school that it doesn't matter where you come from, who you, what color you are, what ethnicity you are, as long as you have a passion for what you love to do, you can do it and you can create a group like us to create something so powerful that's gonna keep growing in the years after we graduate. We'll be partnering up with one of our organizations at Sunset called B3 Ambassadors, which will continue the project and but it would also continue us to be doing the project. And we also wanna say that we're so grateful to have been able to let these people share their stories and let it be heard on this stage. Thank you. Shifting narratives throughout Dallas, whether it's mobility and gentrification, immigration, those two things we heard from Dallas that those, we have to challenge them around those topics. As part of the process, when we're invited to a city, we ask how can we tailor the program to the district? And so that's something we heard and it was validated because two of the three teams here today took on those challenges. And so next we have hailing from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay. Go Eagles. Uh, we have John Bartram High School, who took on the challenge that you'll hear around using art to, to raise awareness about the school to prison pipeline through their Give Us Our Crowns project. Welcome John Bartram High School. tell them you cannot be the dumb mice that get three on the trap. The traps are there for all of us. They're there because they need the easiest fuel source possible. And the easiest fuel source is one where you create an atmosphere of poverty. You restrict all of the programs inside the schools that make people want to be more interesting and enriching and new things. You pull all of that out. You do things like allow drugs and violence to a degree so people get comfortable doing it until you crash down on it. All of that creates a healthy atmosphere for them to just go and scoop. So our job is to say, no, 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 no. I, I've seen somebody step on that glue and I will never see them again. So I'm not doing it. You have to. And that's what we can control. We can do 
for it because they depend on us. And by us, I mean anybody that's not rich. I'm, I'm talking low class. I'm talking low class of any race. And then when you go black, it's just a whole nother. But before I get in that world, anybody just say low class. Anybody that's not privileged, anybody that's not rich is here to feed systems that make the richest, richest, richest. Wow. That's what I think if you can imbue that into Stop your pride, you're a man that say don't be easy. Awesome, thank you. Man. I'm Sabria. I'm Simon. I'm Micaiah. I'm Augustus. I'm Abubakar. I'm Jason. And I'm Amber, and we are Bartram High Give Us Our Crowns. We chose Jane Golding's challenge to bring awareness to our community about the school to prison pipeline. We chose this challenge for several reasons. First, initial surveys in the community reflected a desire for there to be an emphasis on motivating students educationally and creating a safe and thriving community. Statistics also showed that while Southwest Philadelphia is not the most unsafe neighborhood, its rates of crime and arrest make it a breeding ground for the criminal justice system. Additionally, this challenge resonated with us as members of a high school notorious for its dangerous climate. In fact, just last year, Bartram High School had 71 violent and nonviolent incidences. We recognize how much the atmosphere, culture, and policies of the school and community may be contributing to our students' behavior and wonder if we could use this as a way to spark community pride, increase policy and procedure perform, and have more positive interaction with the youth of our community. It was in this vein that we created Give Us Our Crowns. This is a movement about restoring how people see children that are most affected by the school to prison pipeline and bring awareness to the systems and forces that help contribute to these distorted perceptions. Our slogan is coordination over incarceration. Give us our crowns believes that if ch people see children educated in restorative and enlightening environments, they will seek out more solutions to keep them out of jails instead of putting them in. So how do we start? We wanted to do an art medium that was both gratifying and restorative to those who helped create it, but also beautiful and symbolic to those who view it. We decided upon a 1,000 crane project. This was borrowed from Japanese folklore that says folding 1,000 cranes grants one wish, in our case, a wish to eradicate the school to prison pipeline. After researching about school to prison pipeline, we decided to bring awareness to, um, we decided to bring awareness. First, spreading the word about what is happening was important. So we decided to create a website and a social media page, and we used origami displays on the local businesses to advertise our campaign. Our website not only provided with facts and stacks, but also provided with other behavioral intervention for teachers instead of making disciplinary referral to principal or school police. It also provided resources for students. Our goal was to get 500 people to view our website, and 50 people at least a day contribute their thoughts on our social media page. Secondly, we brought origami displays to the community to drive traffic to our website. Each partner was educated on school to prison pipeline and asked one way they could identify children stigmatized within the system. Their commitment with their displacement, along with a brief description of school to prison pipeline to be shared with their patrons. We partner with Bartram High School to identify students and teachers in need of rapid building to host restorative craft session in which the students and teachers, using instruction from our website, created their organic cranes. Crane's making was used to help them gain a better understanding in an effort to reframe their perceptions that cranes were displayed in Bartram High School and throughout the community. We partnered with Patterson Elementary School, Myers Recreation Center, and the Attic to make cranes with students, parents, and community members dear to or told about the school to prison pipeline. We even partnered with the Art and Theater production of 5 to 10 to display our cranes and host talk backs about the school to prison pipeline. Our school counselor distributed origami papers and instructions to students to use instead of making bad behavioral choices. The students could then submit their cranes to our team to be using our display. We educated our school police about the pipeline. Our school police were asked to help create cranes with students and to make a commitment in helping stigmatize children much the same way as our community partners were. Pre and post surveys of teachers and students who participated in our crane making showed that 100% of teachers and 93% of students felt that it was helpful in changing their perspectives of students or of themselves. In fact, some teachers felt so empathetic about our initiative that they created lesson plans about the school to prison pipeline to deepen the conversation. At the time of this presentation, we have had over 500 people view our website, 
We created over 1,000 cranes to put up 40 displays in schools and throughout the Southwest community. Since the competition has ended, we have witnessed a spark in students and staff about our work. Students are able to articulate their disciplinary experiences more clearly since learning about the school to prison pipeline, and this is causing our administrators to look at the school policies of the school year that has just ended and for the next school year as well. So let us recap. In response to using art to bring awareness to the school to prison pipeline, we created origami crane displays that were used as both advertisement for our website and social media page that share information and also were used as a restorative intervention to help and to educate students. We partnered with Bartram High School teachers, Myers Recreation Center, the Attic, Patterson Elementary School, the 12th District Police Department, Bartram School Police, and 30 businesses create the art that was informative and restorative. Overall, we were able to spread the word over to 1,500 community members and counting. What's next? We would like to build on our success. Now that the community is beginning to become aware of the school to prison pipeline by creating an after school art mentoring program in which we create art with neighboring elementary and middle school students as a way to offer alternative coping skills. This will mean an expansion of our team to include other high school mentors, some which have been a part of the criminal justice system. This program will start in January in 2019. Additionally, we are working with the men of Bartram to establish a Give Us Our Crowns College Scholarship to be awarded to a senior who is or was a part of the criminal justice system, but who has overcame the odds and completed high school. Fundraisers will be held this upcoming school year. We put origami creation stations in our school for students, that need to for students who need to de-escalate instead of being sent to the school police or the principal's office. Although it is easy to think the school to prison pipeline only affects certain students and communities like those of Bartram, remember, its consequences are felt throughout society. Children, our future leaders, a child who is not in school cannot be taught. Knowledge is power. We ask that you choose to coordinate over incarcerate. We ask that you yeah, give us our, our crowns. crowns. Go, girl. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Wow. Can we give all of our teams another round of applause? I'm sorry to ask, but can we stand and recognize all of the work that they were able to do in just eight weeks? Thank you, thank you, thank you. In just eight short weeks, this is what they are, this is what is possible. And so hopefully you walk away today with the understanding that youth can, right? That youth can lead, youth can make a difference, and they can do that today. So the Aspen Challenge will continue. We launch in a new city every year. And so we'll keep working with Dallas and Philadelphia, and we'll, we'll, we'll <clears throat> excuse me, and we'll continue to launch uh, in, can I say it? Louisville, Kentucky next year. I'm sorry, I was stumbling, but we're going to Louisville next year. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Katie. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Our students will be around if you want to come and ask them questions. Uh, but again, I think I've said enough. I'm going to step aside and elevate their voice again. Thank you, everyone.